Hey guys, it's Dr. Baum. Um, really uh, happy to uh, do this session for you guys tomorrow. Um, I wanted to uh, try something a little bit different. I think, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, you sort of just have to show up and absorb as much of the information as possible. But, um, you know, even with the recordings on Microsoft Teams, I, I, I'm just not convinced that you guys really retain a lot of the information. You know, this is uh, kind of a similar system and setup that uh, that we use for a lot of our patients with Playback Health. So I thought it might actually make sense to do just a quick run through that you guys can then reference now uh, before the talk, but also in the future. And just reviewing kind of the, you know, maybe the, the top five or ten things that I look for when I start reviewing imaging. So let's take a look. Um, so the first thing I want to show you is MRI. This is typically, you know, the thing that uh, everybody wants, uh, that uh, is the first thing that we look at. The first thing that you have to know is what sequence am I looking at on an MRI? And so the first way to tell that without even looking at the labels is what's bright. All right. Now, um, one of the important things that you should know is the terminology that you should use when describing what you see on an MRI scan. Bright versus dark on an MRI is intensity, okay? So we're going to describe something as being hyper-intense, hypo-intense, or iso-intense. So hyper meaning more intense, hypo meaning less intense, and iso-intense meaning it's the same intensity as something else. So if you see two things being bright, fat and water, you know that it's a T2 image. And so that's what we're looking at here. It's a T2 sequence. This has to do with the way that the magnet aligns the water molecules. And then as they relax back, the signal that's received is then converted into this data. So this is what we look at first when we're in the office or we're in the hospital for an MRI. So this is a cervical MRI, a T2 sequence. The way that you would describe it is that the image on the left is a sagittal image, meaning it's looking at it from the side as if you cut the body straight down the middle. And the one on the right is called an axial. And an axial is like little sandwich meat cuts in a cross section going through the neck like this. The first thing that we typically look at is the soft tissue and sort of the neural elements, right? So this is the cerebellum, the base of the brain. This is the occipital lobe, the cerebellum, the brainstem, the pons, the medulla, which then takes us into the cervical spinal cord. First thing that you should be looking for on all MRI scans are where are the cervical tonsils? And so right off the bat, you can draw a line from here to here and if the tonsils are below this point and this patients are slightly, that's the definition of a Chiari malformation. So even though we're looking at an MRI for spine, we should always be thinking about all of the brain pathologies as well. So no Chiari malformation here. You want to look for the white hyperintense fluid. This is CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, and looking in the front of the spine and the back of the spine. You can see that the spinal cord then continues down. And in the cervical spine, there's seven bones in the neck. C1, which is right up here, you don't see it because it's a ring. And so you're only seeing the two points in cross section. C2, which is the finger like projection, is right here. And then the subaxial spine is C3 through C7. So C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. Uh, what the next thing we look for are all of the discs and we look to make sure that everything is well aligned and there's no little bulges or dots and here what we can see is that there are some disc bulges these disc bulges represent degenerative disc disease which is uh, not uncommon in patients with cervical pathology as we scroll through on the axial the spinal cord is sort of kidney bean or oval shaped and so we look to make sure that there's no spinal cord compression and no spinal nerve compression, which are these are the channels. Really off the bat, I would say focus on the spinal cord. This is going to be the most obvious thing. The other things to look at are all of the soft tissue, right? This is not just an MRI of the spinal cord, but these dots over here on either side of the spine are the vertebral arteries, and you're going to want to make sure that the signal, the intensity is the same in each of these. Likewise, these are the carotid arteries, these are the jugular veins, and you can even see some of the structures of the trachea down here, and as well as the, uh, the pharynx and all the way, uh, you know, going up to uh, even seeing sometimes some of the tongue and all the other structures. The next thing that I want to show you guys is uh, uh, an MRI of the lumbar spine. So let's find it right here. 
And an MRI of the lumbar spine, again, is going to be looking at what type of sequence is this? Is this a T1 or a T2? So I'll let you guys answer and I'll give you kind of 10 seconds. There's two things that are bright, the fluid and the fat. So if you answer T2, you'd be correct. Now let me switch to a T1 because I think that in the lumbar spine, this is actually uh, uh, you know, very helpful to be able to see. So if you look here, there's really only one thing that's bright and that's the fat. So if there's only one thing that's bright, that's a T1 sequence. T1 sequences are really good at looking for blood. And there's a lot of nuance, so I, what I'll do is I'm going to kind of leave that for another time. But because you can look at fat very well, in the lumbar spine, you can actually scroll out and you can see the neural foramen very, very well. And what you can see here is that each one of the neural foramen should look like a fried egg. The white is the fat and the dark is the nerve. And you can scroll out on each side. And so this is what you should be looking for. The same thing as in the cervical spine is you should be looking at not only the spine, but the other structures. And the other structures include the aorta, the vena cava, the kidneys, even some of the intra-abdominal contents. Commonly, when you guys are called for, say, a rule-out cauda equina syndrome in the ER, pay special attention to this area in front of the spine. If you don't see a big distended bladder, it's pretty unlikely that the patient has cauda equina. And so these are the types of things that you should be looking for that are, that are particularly helpful. So that's a quick review of MRIs. The next thing I wanna show you are CT scans. CT scans, as you know, are three-dimensional x-rays, all right? So when we talk about CT scans, we talk about density. MRIs, intensity, CTs, density, all right? And so what you can look for is this is a bone window, and there are also soft tissue windows that you can look at as well. And this is an example of a soft tissue window. Um, oftentimes, if when patients are in the ER and they say, oh, we can't get any imaging, we want you to admit them, tell them to get a CT scan. Because we can actually glean a lot of information from a CT scan just by looking for particular shadows. While most of the time we're looking for acute fractures, and so you're going to want to follow these lines. This is a thoracic uh, CT scan. And same thing, we can go through and look at the sagittal and the axial. I think that's very important. Anything that's dark, which is hypodense, typically is air or gas. And you can see this hypodensity within the disc space. This is actually nitrogen gas that's present because of arthritis and disc degeneration. Same thing. It doesn't have to be a dedicated CT scan of the spine. There's a lot of information that we can glean about the spine, the bone, and the neural elements from, say, a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And all you have to do is window it appropriately or call the radiologist and tell them what they're looking for, and they can really give you a lot of information. Oftentimes... One of the most important things that we can get are x-rays, and x-rays are super easy to get, and there's a lot of information that we can gather, largely because x-rays are taken with the patient sitting up or standing up. The patient does not live life lying down the way that they would be when they get a CT scan or an MRI, so you can actually learn a lot about the alignment. This is a, an x-ray of the cervical spine, and so the sagittal here is on the right-hand side. We don't call it a sagittal, we call it a lateral. All right, so a lateral x-ray. This is C1. C2 is here, the finger-like projection. You can see how C1 and C2 form this complex of the ring and the circle. And that's really what allows uh, the, the neck to provide 50% of the rotation. One other thing to look for is something called the spinal laminar line. And so this line right here, I'll draw a line kind of along it. This is the line of the lateral masses. And the next line you want to look at here is the line of the lamina. If these two lines are right on top of each other, you know for certain that the patient has cervical stenosis. They have congenital cervical stenosis. If there's a little bit of room here, you can imagine that if a patient has either an abnormal alignment or a herniated disc, they still may have the ability to tolerate this uh, without a lot of issue. All right. So these are the x-rays. The look from the front is called an AP, anterior, posterior. And this is where you can see a lot of really good information about the arthritis, 
the overall alignment and whether there's scoliosis. There's a lot more information to go through, but don't hesitate to ask them to get x-rays because we can actually get a lot of information, especially about patients who are coming in just with complaints of neck or back pain just by looking at x-rays. The other benefit is that we can obtain dynamic imaging. These are called flexion and extension x-rays. These are particularly important, especially in patients who have had a trauma. Flexion extension x-rays tell us if there's any dynamic instability, and you can see here that the patient's alignment changes from flexion to extension. Everything is still in good alignment. You can follow the back of the vertebral bodies, and so again, I do not think that there's any dynamic instability in this patient. The next thing that we can look at are lumbar x-rays, and so here's an example of some lumbar x-rays. Five bones in the lumbar spine, and then this is the sacrum, which is the tailbone. Look at the disc heights, Look at the alignment to make sure there's not a spondylolisthesis. And again, flexion and extension x-rays are particularly important. The other thing is that often, uh, just looking at an AP, you can glean whether or not a patient has a scoliosis. And even if the imaging looks uh, normal on the CT or the MRI, sometimes they can have a dynamic uh, nerve root compression because they have a scoliosis. So this is another really important piece of information that I think you guys should review. This is meant to just be a quick overview that I want you guys to have for your reference. Please review this tomorrow because this will allow us to really, I think, uh, um, get more in depth and in a short period of time. I don't want these lectures to take up, uh, you know, hours and hours. We should really shoot for 20 to 30 minutes of really high yield information and we'll discuss the types of things to look for on either MRI, CT scans, or x-rays. I hope this has been helpful and I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.